peripheral sorts of reasons why people said they didn't want to vote were uh, voter fatigue, including very long and complicated ballots, too many elections in one short period, uh, a general just trust of government and elected officials, the belief that an individual vote doesn't matter, the lack of familiarity with voting procedures, lack of information about candidates and their issues. So our body realized that any effort to structurally change election processes, any external changes that were to be made is only half the solution. If we do not build a culture that feeds a voting culture and civic engagement, we have only completed half our journey. We also were cognizant that municipal voting is and its uh, low turnout is not unique to the city of Los Angeles, but seems to be a common trend with cities across the entire nation. So after this great effort between February and June, we now present to you 33 separate recommendations, which we hope will address the challenge on both the fronts I mentioned above, building a voting culture and making structural changes that will work. I will highlight a few of them for you. On the area of voter registration and voter files, we would urge that the city put more effort into staffing efforts on registering voters in neighborhoods with a large number of potential eligible voters but low registration rates, explore engaging neighborhood councils in voter registration activities, and continue partnering in a greater effort with civic and service organizations and high schools and colleges to, uh, uh, in the period leading up to elections. The city should also uh, request the county registrar of voters to be more proactive in accurately identifying inactive voters. Uh, the reason that we bring this up is because it, there may be a uh, situation where the voter registration rolls are actually carrying a large significant number of folks that are either deceased or moved away uh, and therefore uh, are not able to vote and they skew the uh, ch uh, numbers when figuring turnout. In the matter of early voting and polling places, we thought that the city should, at the time it becomes practical, create a citywide network of early voting locations. This is not in it in lieu of precinct voting, but a supplement in advance of uh, regular precinct voting. Um, we would suggest that the city clerk try a pilot program on uh, expanding to non-traditional voting venues, such as shopping centers, malls, and supermarkets. Um, in the matter of uh, outreach, uh, we strongly, and we took a separate uh, resolution as a body, that in recognition of the diverse and changing demograph demo demographics of the city, uh, we must, uh, all activities that will increase vote, voter registration and voter participation must be conducted with cognizance of the needs of the underrepresented populations within our city, whether they be ethnic and their language challenges or socioeconomic or the disabled. We believe the city should provide greater funding to the Office of the City Clerk for voter awareness and outreach activities to promote that culture of voting. Uh, we need to involve the city's workforce and neighborhood councils in promoting election day. Uh, we have 30, 40,000 city employees and they can do their part by wearing buttons, uh, making sure that election materials are stacked on their public counters, it's, et cetera. We exhort the council to adopt the 10 recommendations provided by the Alternative Voting Methods Report published back on October 21st, 2013. Uh, we would like to ask the council to ask the Unified School District to restore civics education as a separate course requirement and that the city should look for opportunities to collaborate with the LAUSD in high school civic outreach activities. Um, Another two ideas we had for uh, assisting voters is we, the city should support state legislation that would allow election officials to accept vote by mail ballots that are postmarked by election day. Right now, uh, the city clerk can only accept ballots that are received by election day. So state legislation would allow us to accept them after election day, um, up to three days after, as long as they're postmarked on election day and to also explore the possibility of 
providing prepaid uh, return postage on vote by mail ballots. These are just some of the ideas that we went through. Um, that the c commission hey, was. Hey, June, could I ask a couple quick questions? Yes, sir. Because I'll forget if I don't do it now. So we have a significant percentage of ballots that come in after the election day. Well, it it isn't a huge amount. I believe after this most recent election, it was something like two to three thousand. Okay, but our commission, we were not proud. We'll take any vote as it comes in. So change comes incrementally. Whatever we can do to build up either voter interest, civic engagement, or the amount of votes that come in, we were not too proud to look at. So um, even though the amount of votes that came in after compared to, you know, so many thousands uh, is, is relatively no, don't, small. Don't defend it. I find mm -hmm. merit in that. And I'm I sorry, was this just curious. If I may, just for one moment, Jeffrey Dar. Hi, uh, Jeffrey. Or uh, Mr. Dar. Keep, yeah. Commissioner. Jeff is fine, too. Uh, keep in mind the following, which is the voters who cast their ballots and they arrive after the election day don't ever know that their votes weren't even counted. To me, that's the most serious part of it because they intend to vote. They think they voted. Reality is they are not being counted. Got gotcha. you. Holly? Holly Walcott, interim city clerk. There's about two to 600 that don't get counted, and while... Um, Commissioner Dar is correct. They don't know. They can check. Anybody who does a vote by mail or provisional ballot has a um, receipt and they can check to see whether their vote was counted. But I don't have any objection to changing the rules, but it, it is a state law that has to be changed. Okay, I get that, but that's interesting. I, the other, the, Dolores? I just want to, um, Dolores Spears, I just wanted to, to also mention that um, it is a belief that if the ballot is postmarked um, by the election day, even if it comes in after election day, that it should be counted. No, I th I, like I said, I find merit in that. That's, uh, these are, this is just one e example of the types of thoughts that I, for one, wanted to get uh, from the, the commission. I have another question. Um, w you talked about early voting venues or what have you, uh, if you could just take a couple of moments, because I've got some other items and more people than anticipated here to speak on them, but if I could hear your thoughts on that, you know, where would we place them? How would they be monitored? Because I support that, well, in, philosophically I support that as well. So how would that work? We'd put them at libraries, Police. I don't know about the markets, but I'm curious. I'll make the first stab, and then uh, certainly uh, exhort my colleagues and, and the city clerk to to uh, support me. Early voting is a technique which does not replace the, the regular voting on on election day, and it does not replace vote by mail. So it is a a third opportunity for people to be able to cast their vote. The philosophy is that you would not. Uh, do it through the regular precinct model, which is very expensive. You would uh, use a formula and decide on a fixed number of what we would call neighborhood voting centers throughout the city. Centrally located uh, are able to hold a large number of people well positioned for transportation access. At these neighborhood voting centers, you could either come and drop off your voted vote-by-mail ballot or you could um, uh, cast a ballot. Uh, the difficulty in this great so you, idea... you could get a ballot at the location. In yes, but here's the, here's the challenge. This uh, will not be able to be done until such time as the city gets a new voting system, which is what we're waiting for the County of Los Angeles to finish developing, because legally in the spirit of the law and to the letter of the law, any person that went to any voting center would be, should be able to get the ballot that relates to them. That is to say, if I work in Van Nuys, but I live in East Los Angeles, I should be able to go to any voting center in the city and be able to get the ballot for my home. 
this is not possible now because of the constraints of the voting system that we are operating on now. So early voting is a great idea, something that the Commission was very excited about, but we are cognizant that it cannot happen with the technology that we have now until such time as the county fully develops and tests its um, new voting system. And then it will depend whether or not the council decides whether to allow the county to operate the city's elections or if the city will borrow the, the county's equipment and operate elections on their own. Okay. I don't know when it was. I'm sure you were, maybe you weren't the clerk, but you might have been, you know, the chief. But wasn't there several years ago you could go to libraries and things of that nature? And, and because I know I voted, I did that twice, once when I was in the legislature and once when I was on the council. So when I go into my Washington, Washington Irving Library, if I lived in East L.A., I would have not been able to vote? There, there were several years. Because Washington Irving's in my, the district I live in. There were several years. I think there were two different election cycles where we had deployed um, touchscreen mm. systems. They were, yeah. they were decertified by the Secretary of State. That sure made it easy, though. All right, so I'm sorry to interrupt you, so you can... I'm nearly done. Um, so on all these new ideas, new mind turnings, new experiments, your commission was of a unanimous mind. Where we differed was on the most complex change, moving the date of the city's elections. Um, the commission presents to you three alternatives. The first alternative, which was uh, supported by six of nine of the commissioners with three members presenting a minority report, was to change the date of the city's elections to November of odd number years. Um, with, the proviso, with the proviso that it is assumed that the county take those elections and that the city clerk should not run concurrent elections at the same time because concurrent elections is a, a very confusing um, ideology to voters. I think it does a disservice to voters. It is expensive. S uh, so that is one caveat. The other caveat is that the city not change these dates until and unless the county implements their new voting system. Also, that this change not happen until the city studies a cost of conducting a municipal election in, June, in November of even numbered years if it is consolidated with the county. Um, also, that with the caveat that the city conduct robust outreach and commit additional resources toward voter outreach because this change is pretty major and we do not want voters to be confused. The commission went on to say that should the council make the decision not to move to June and November of odd number of years, even years, even years, that the second alternative should be to change to June and November of odd years, that is to say in off-cycle elections. Um, the advantage of this is that people usually know November as election day, election month anyway. And there is a uh, theory that if we can get all municipalities in Southern California, in LA County, to hold their city elections, in the same period of time, in the off year, that it will create a culture of this is city voting day. This is where um, Long Beach and, and Burbank and Los Angeles all hold their respective city elections. We can uh, pool on each other's interest. Um, we can share resources. And um, in that way, we believe that turnout could be increased. The last alternative, if the council chooses not to change the date to no June or November of even or odd years, is to keep them where they are in the spring, but to move the primary and runoff apart a little bit more so that there is more time. Right now it's a two-month turnover, uh, and it's hard for the clerk to con uh, conduct their canvas and so forth. So we would recommend uh, a little bit spacing of time between the primary and the runoff, and also that um, the canvas period for the clerk be extended from 21 to 28 days in light of that extension. Um, 
that is a very brief summary of the work of our commission. I personally want to thank Mayor Garcetti for the chance to serve on this commission. I want to thank my talented colleagues and especially thank the incredible dedication and work provided by uh, your staff, other council staff, the Office of the City Clerk, the City Attorney, the City Ethics Commission, the CLA and the CAO. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to my colleagues who I encourage to give you their personal perspective, and we are here to answer any questions that you may have. Well, well um, we're not going to take action today. We're going to take your documents and have them vetted by our neighborhood councils as well. This was not some kind of you know, quick uh, process. So before, uh, I, and I, of course I, I want to hear from all of the commissioners, but before we, we go there, I want to thank you for all of the time. This was a collaboration between the mayor and myself because we, we felt that it was important that we took a hard look at uh, ways to increase uh, voter participation. Now, for, for me personally, I view this as kind of like step one. So don't be surprised if we don't ask you to reconvene because there just wasn't enough time to discuss issues like how individuals put things on the ballot. Should that be, you know, reviewed? How many signatures? There are so many other questions that I think we benefit from from your knowledge. So I'm saying don't, if you go to uh, Hawaii, make sure you have a return ticket because we, <laughs> we may call you back in into uh, service. But I do appreciate that. And Mr. Weezar, did you want to say anything before I let the uh, commissioners close, the, the, the other ones? No, I just want to thank the commission for doing a thorough uh, review some thoughtful recommendations. My only question is, earlier, June, you mentioned, when you started, um, you mentioned the reasons why we may have low voter turnout, and I missed, um, you know, there was voter fatigue, distrust of government, you, you went through a number of items. Was that an actual poll taken, or that's just uh, anecdotal discussions that people have? These were comments made to us by the people that we interviewed, by the people that uh, gave testimony, um, they are not documented, you Sorry. know, in a study okay. or anything. But they were, um, you know, presented to the commission by different experts and from community members. Yeah. Okay, because I think if we actually have some hard statistical data, we can the, and rank the reasons why, but, but sir, then it could help us re come sure. up with a solution, right? So a better solution. Sure. There, so. there were two categories. One was actually made from a study. Oh, okay? okay. The okay. studies, which were of people polled after the 2012 presidential election statistically uh, did list uh, too busy, 19 percent, lack of interest, 16 percent, illness or disability, 14 percent, oh, okay. did not like the candidate, 13 percent, out of town, 8 percent, etc. So that one was particularly relevant to the study. Yeah. Some of the others that I read after that presentation were anecdotal. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Dart, uh, th there was U.S. Census data, so it's quite reliable. It's from the uh, from the 2008 presidential election where uh, we have a very detailed census report which includes uh, their review of why uh, a huge number of people did not vote and the uh, numbers we have in our report come from that, they're cited to that. 18% uh, claim they were too busy or conflicting work or school schedules and that comes not from uh, mere comments to us, it comes from the U.S. Census. Just that, that was for specifically the, answer. Yeah, but that was for the presidential race. It wasn't for a municipal mayor's race. Correct. For, okay, thank you. Which is part of the reason why, uh, just to supplement uh, Jeffrey Dart, um, if we move the elections, even if it's in an odd year or an even year, to June, November, those are at least more familiar dates to voters than while we've had a tradition of voting at a different type of schedule for uh, City of Los Angeles municipal elections, uh, they don't match what still people culturally think is when they go to vote, which, for example, for a runoff would be November. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. And I can assure you, Mr. Weezar, based on the data, when it talked about didn't like the candidate, there was there was no reference to you or no, I. No, in my election, nobody <laughs> came out of that election saying that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why don't we start uh, with with Dolores with you? Um, I'll, I'll be um, brief because I know your time is important. But June uh, covered most of um, um, my thoughts. Um, I was on the uh, outreach ad hoc committee and. Um, with, came up with the information with regards to why people don't vote. But one of the, the biggest things that came out of my committee is the outreach. Um, people are confused when polling places um, are moved. Um, there is um, misinformation that is um, prevalent out there with the general public, um, such as <clears throat> um, our citizens that are out of the country and how they are uh, allowed to vote, what, what they can and cannot do. Um, uh, um, information with regards to whether someone that has been arrested but not convicted still has the right to, to vote. So it's a lot of misinformation out there and, and um, information and correct information um, should be widespread, whatever the council decides to do. Yeah. Sure. Um, first, it's been a pleasure to work with everyone. Uh, the, the process resulted in a really great group of people with very diverse backgrounds and experiences. And together, we really worked well. And I think we complemented each other because we all came from different walks of life. So it, it, the process worked extremely well. And I should also note that our uh, clerk, Holly Wolcott, was extremely helpful and indispensable to our process. While she's here, uh, it's, it's easy just to assume she's part of the process, but frankly, a, a lot of what we did, I don't think we could have done without her active participation, knowledge, and resource. So uh, with regard to a couple quick comments. Uh, one, uh, on a personal level, I think that the city needs to engage better with our young people. We used to have civics taught in school, I remember myself growing up in Van Nuys in elementary school. At, some, at that time, and I don't remember the details anymore because it's been unfortunately way too long, I was a council member for the day yeah. with then council member Nardi Bernardi. I remember coming down here, by the way, and I was in sixth grade. We used to have those type of reach outs, and I know that the people who were selected all previously were already familiar with city government. Today, no one knows city government. So when we have our elections, there's a disconnect from day one when they turn 18. Uh, that's a more complicated issue, but there are little baby steps we can take to start engaging young people before they vote so they're familiar with city government, since we're talking about municipal elections. Good uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, when you go through the report, and as you heard from our vice chair, June, there was a 6-3 split on the largest recommendation, which was uh, when do we move our, uh, as a recommendation, our municipal elections. And I was part of the ad hoc research committee each ad hoc committee was three commissioners. Uh, I was part of the minority, so I just wanted to speak to that for a moment because I do have serious concerns as to the majority but, uh, recommendation you know, but, on that. But let me, let me, let me check you there, and, I, and it is with respect. This, there are 15 members of a, this council, and when we make a vote, if it's 8 to 7, if it's 10 to 5, that is the recommendation of this council. So... I respect the minority report, but uh, it, the way I view it, you're representing the majority of the commission that you that you set on. So if we could just, I, I, I'm sure there'll be other opportunities for you guys to send us documents or what have you. But the commission that you were a member on voted two to one to mm -hmm. do one thing. And I think that that's what's going to go before this council, and we'll discuss all of it. So I, I just don't know how appropriate it is for us to go off kilter on that today. No, no, I was going to make these as a personal comment since I understood we were being given an opportunity to speak personally. I was not purporting to speak on behalf of the commission. I respect the commission's recommendation, uh, and there's reports for the vast majority, which is unanimous, and mm -hmm. there is a, two minority reports, one on uh, the uh, question of when do you move the uh, election. Everyone agrees to June, November, just odd or even, and there's another minority report on weekend elections. 
So on that, on that end, I will then uh, end my comments since I know you have a busy calendar. And unfortunately, we do. But again, Holly, thank you for all of the assistance that you uh, provided the commission. Commission, be assured that we're going to look at every aspect of what you reviewed. Yes and no and everything. This is not, there's no vote on this Tuesday. This is going to be a, a thought out and methodical uh, process, which we're trying to, to get to on this council. So again, I thank you for everything. I've got to say at this point, Mr. Weezer, that without objection, we will hold this item in committee, ask for a report back on the recommendations from the CAO, CLA, and with the assistance of the city attorney and city clerk's office, and uh, I am requesting uh, heavily that this uh, uh, be back before this body on September 8th. Okay, we will also ask uh, Dunn uh, to send this report to the neighborhood councils and request that we get public comment from them uh, up until September 15th. Uh, we want to hear from everybody. So without objection, commissioners, thank you. Holly, thank you. That'll be the order. But do somebody want to say something? Yeah, President Wesson, uh, with all of the thank yous that went around, I don't know what department the audio person uh, works in, but we'd like to thank him as well and, and whoever else was sitting in the booth um, because they, they hung with us throughout the whole process. Did you really? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> no, that's nice for you to say that again. From, thank you. I, I mean, it, it means a lot when people volunteer, no pay, when, June has been here working for the city since she was nine, and yet she comes, no, eight, eight, and she comes back and spends this time. So it's greatly appreciated. Please know that. All right, Madam Clerk, uh, let's go to, we'll have one minute comment. Since we have so many, we'll start with item seven. And item seven is a CLA report and resolution relative su to supporting SB 1275, which seeks to ensure the benefits of electric transportation and clean air technologies are broadly shared. Okay, let's start out again. One minute, Linda Escalante, Yasmin Vargas. Oh, uh, is it Olivia? Please, if you if you three would come up, and then I will. Bring up the rest, one minute per person, if you'd identify yourself, and then go ahead. Good morning. I'm Linda Escalante, policy advocate for NRDC. NRDC is proud to support SB 1275, along with a very diverse coalition of allies across the state, made up by environmental, environmental justice, and public health organizations, such as CBE, Green Lining Institute, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the American Lung Association, among many, many others. Four of, out of ten Californians live close enough to a freeway or busy road so that they are have a, at a greater risk of asthma, cardiovascular disease, and even autism, as now more, more recent studies have shown. And we well know that most disproportionate impacts are suffered by low-income communities of color. Accelerating the deployment of zero-emission vehicles is critical to achieving California clean air standards and greenhouse gas reduction targets. We support SB 1275, which in aims to bring 1 million electric cars, trucks, and buses to California over the next decade and to ensure that low-income Californians uh, who are disproportionately impacted by air pollution benefit from the transition to a clean transportation sector. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could have the next speaker. Yes. Good morning. My name is Jasmine Vargas. I'm with the Sierra Club, uh, the Beyond Coal campaign organizer, and I'm proud to be working in Los Angeles to get us all off of fossil fuels and coal-fired power. I commend the leadership of the council of the president and Jose Huizar for really taking a stand against climate change. And I think that by supporting SB 1275 at the state level, we in Los Angeles and with you all can really be leaders in the state as well. Uh, considering we are a massively urban and 
uh, single vehicle use transport city. Uh, we are doing great things to create alternative forms of transport, but we definitely have to work on reducing the pollution and the toxins coming out of tailpipes of cars. By being able to answer the issue of climate change, we'll also be able to answer the issue of localized toxic pollution and the health impacts that come from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before you start, if I could get, uh, is it Darrow Molina? And I'll let you say the last name. And I believe this is Mr. Herman. I'm not sure. And uh, Irving Shannon. Please identify yourself and speak. You. Okay. Well, good morning. My name is Olivia Voris, and I'm an intern with Environment California, one of five organizations sponsoring the Charge Ahead California legislation, authored by Senator De Leon. The American Lung Association recently released its 2014 list of the U.S. cities with the worst air pollution, and Car Heavy Los Angeles topped the list for the 14th time in 15 years. The cars, trucks, and buses that we drive every day contribute more global warming pollution than any other single source in our state. So we have a tremendous opportunity with SB, with SB 1275 to reduce air pollution, combat climate change, improve public health, and save working families money. Together, we can charge ahead and place one million clean electric vehicles on California's roads and ensure that all Californians benefit from cleaner vehicles, especially lower-income households in the communities most impacted by air pollution. I would like to thank Councilmember Wezar for introducing this resolution, and I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. I, next, uh, just identify yourself. Good morning. My name is Daryl Molina Sarmiento, and I'm the Southern California Program Director with CBE, Communities for a Better Environment. On behalf of our members and supporters across the state of California, I urge you to support the Charge Ahead California Initiative, SB 1275. This bill will ensure that all communities directly benefit from the transition to clean transportation over the next 10 years. Why this is important is because four out of 10 Californians live close enough to a freeway or busy road to put them at increased risk of asthma, cancer, and other health hazards. Pollution from fossil fuel production and burning fossil fuel disproportionately impacts the health and well-being of our communities. In addition, the average household spends almost $3,000 on gas annually, straining family budgets and hitting lower income households especially hard. SB 1275 is both expanding the zero emission market and introducing clean transportation alternatives into deserving and vulnerable communities. Thank you so much, Council Member Huisa, for your support. Thank you so very much. Next. And the last speaker, do we have For the record, my Jorge, name is Mr. Oh, one second, Mr. Herman. Jorge Madrid. If you could come. Okay, now, Mr. Uh, Herman. Yes, going on this motion here, Kevin DeLeon really stepped into it after Jose Weizar failed to do much about the Vernon environment crisis going on today. So, what does yes, have to do our with? health is impacted by what seeks to ensure the benefits of electric transportation and clean air technologies. We're talking about clean air because today our environment impacts our lives. Women, children, and young adults like us who wish to breathe clean air. So when Mr. Weezar failed to do much about No, no, no. Speak on this item, please, Mr. Herman. I love that you have a right to speak, but you just won't play by the rules. You're off the subject. So thank you. We'll call up Mr. Shannon. Just state. No, the point is you're going to stay to the subject. Sergeants, his time has expired. Mr. Irving, no, don't disrupt, disrupt the meeting, Mr. Herman. Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Irvin Shannon. I am Program Manager of West Angeles Community Development Corporation. Good to see you. On behalf of Bishop Charles E. Blake, Tanua Thrash Intuk, our Executive Director, and our board members, we stand in support of SB 1275, understanding the, the implications of vehicular pollution upon the environment, but also those impacts upon low-income and minority families should spur our efforts to increase access to electric vehicles, uh, multiply the number of charging stations, and expand car sharing programs. Uh, moreover, we should aim to ensure that everyone, regardless of their social economic status, has access to such technology. Um, with the passing of this initiative, uh, Los Angeles, specifically South LA residents, can move toward living within a healthy yet uh, equitable community. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Okay, Mr. Madrid. 
Yes, sir. You remind me of me a hundred years ago. Go right in. Uh, well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. My name is Jorge Madrid. Uh, I'm from Lincoln Heights, and I work for the Environmental Defense Fund. I direct all of our partnerships in Southern California. We're here to support this resolution, here to support SB 1275. Uh, the quick stat that I want to share with you is that uh, about 70% of all of our pollution and about 40% of all of our greenhouse gases are coming from the transportation sector. That's, all, that's California wide. In Los Angeles, it's much, much more. But I think we don't need to be a scientist to understand that the exhaust coming out of these cars are dangerous. We need clean cars. We need electric cars. Uh, I'm so happy that uh, my city, Los Angeles, is taking a leadership role on this. And uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman for introducing this and uh, I want to extend the full support of myself and Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that uh, concludes public comment on this point. Mr. Wizar. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank all the speakers who came out today. And uh, as we all know, uh, low-income communities um, receive a disproportionate impact of many uh, issues, uh, whether it's public safety or lack of investment, et cetera. But one thing that we do not see is the pollution in these communities. They're not, it's not readily available, readily tangible. And so I, I love the fact that the state, uh, with our own senator who uh, covers most, uh, some of Los Angeles, is really uh, leading the charge to do more about cleaning up the air in some of these neighborhoods. Uh, so, Mr. President, you know quite well in your advocacy for low-income low communities and protecting our environment uh, how important this legislation is, and uh, it's one of many other things we can be doing to uh, clean up our air, slow the growth of, um, uh, of uh, impacts in our low-income communities, and uh, I ask for an aye vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Wizar. So on item seven, without objection, we'll adopt the CLA report and the resolution. So let it be written, so let it be done. Okay, so let's go to item eight, one minute. And if you guys could be quick, we need to start council in 10 minutes. I have a Wendy Lagaki maybe, and I apologize in advance. Again, I have Jasmine Vargas, I have Linda Escalante, I have Olivia. Again, I have a new one, Georgia Brewer. So if you guys could just start. And quickly. Wendy Legacki, I'm from one Highland. Minute, please. Uh, just for the record, this item is to uh, a resolution and a re CLA report to support the EPA's Clean Power Plan program. Hi, my name is Wendy Legacki. I'm from Highland Park. And I know that... Um, you already are in favor of this, but I want to ask for your support in this resolution. And I don't need to tell you that there's no time to wait, that our environment is in a state of emergency. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Next, just identify. Ah. Jasmine Vargas with Sierra Club Beyond Coal. I also live in Highland Park, actually. Um, and uh, living in Highland Park, I love the fact that we all live around in areas that are green and um, we have a uh, bike lane coming in, and we have real uplifting of our communities. Our communities have been so underserved and underrepresented. And, and like we start, uh, our representative here said, historically, historically underserved. And so I, with the Sierra Club, have really been working and hard at the national level to push the most stringent, just, and strong carbon pollution standards and a clean power plan that the nation can really answer the call that Wendy just alluded to, the huge emergency that we are living today, which is global warming, climate change. So with your leadership in Los Angeles, moving off of coal and getting to clean energy at 100% as soon as possible, we can really show the rest of the world that we can make the difference we need and that with our leadership and the people's power, we can Thank make it you. happen. Thank, Thank you. you. So who do I have next? Is Linda, Olivia, Georgia, Herman, and Mr. Madrid again. Hi. Hi. Linda Escalante with NRDC. We have an obligation to protect our children and future generations from the impacts of climate change. And the Clean Power Plan sets the first ever federal limits on carbon pollution for power plants. The EPA has taken a historical step to curb 40% of the carbon dioxide pollution that, emits, that the U.S. emits into the atmosphere, which comes from coal-fired power plants. As you know, carbon pollution fuels, fuels climate change, which triggers more asthma attacks and respiratory disease, 
worsens air quality and contributes to more frequent, destructive, costly, and deadly extreme weather events, as we have seen in California. Southern California in particular is vulnerable to the worst impacts of climate change from drought and sea level rise, among others. But thanks to the recent prudent decisions, like the city's decision to get off coal and California's passage of AB 32, LA and the state of California are well, well positioned to comply with the standards. This motion deserves your support. Thank you. Thank you. So Olivia, followed by Georgia, followed by Mr. Herman, followed by Mr. Madrid. Yes. Good morning. I'm Olivia Boris, speaking on behalf of Environment California. In his commencement speech at UC Irvine on Saturday, President Obama compared America's uh, challenge to fight global warming to America's mission to go to the moon. It requires a spirit of adventure, a willingness to take risks. It requires optimism, he said. It requires hope. Fortunately, the President's words were backed by an optimistic new policy, the Clean Power Plan, proposed by the EPA just a few weeks ago. The Clean Power Plan builds on nearly a decade of investment in clean energy. It's not the first step, nor will it be the last. But it means that we finally have a plan in place to fight global warming, and it may be our best opportunity to secure a safe and healthy future for our children. I would like to thank Councilmember Koretz for introducing this resolution in support of the Clean Power Plan, and I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Next, please come forward. Yes, my name is Georgia Brewer, and I'm a volunteer with the Southern California Climate Action 350.org. I am in favor of item 8 because it supports the health of our communities and families. Southern California has made tremendous progress in cleaning our air these past four decades, yet so much more needs to be done to prevent climate change, and we need to act now. Cutting carbon pollution is critical to slowing global warming. I urge you to support the EPA Clean Power Plan for the good of our local families and communities, but also to help stop global warming and the changes to our climate that are already occurring. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if I could have Brittany Hall come and stand at the end of the line, Mr. Herman. I was at a hearing and made, a tes made testimony in regards to clean air and clean power. And that time, the 40th District Representative, Ms. Roybal Allard, conducted a very passionate, passionate presentation about her action against the bad environment to, de to destroy our earth. And she stepped it up. And I was pretty shocked that at Cal State LA, many of you weren't there who claim to be a part of that, Mr. Weezar and Mr. Kevin DeLeon. But keep up the good work, Kevin DeLeon, because I support you. I support Ms. Roybal Aller's action to clean up our air. I suffer from asthma, and I'm a victim of, our, of my own environment, like many of you here today. Maybe not now, but when you get as old and as good looking as me, your life will change when the environment impacts your life with pollution and no clean air. So I support the action of clean air, and I'm looking forward for California to shine on, baby. Thank you, Mr. Madrid, Ms. Hall, and is there Michael, Michael from the Sierra Club, maybe I have you in a, uh, state your last name. Mr. Madrid. Hello again, Jorge Madrid uh, from Lincoln Heights, the Senior uh, Partnerships Director for the Environmental Defense Fund, here again to speak in support of LA's leadership, Los Angeles' leadership on this issue. We knew climate change is real. Uh, we're not on the wrong side of history, and for that I'm very proud. Uh, I think we need to uh, recognize that when, when, when we, LA, does something like this, uh, it, it really reverberates throughout the country. Uh, I, I'm here in support of this rule. Um, I'm also here to, uh, uh, to uh, support the transition to clean energy, to cleaner fuels, and the other uh, uh, positive benefits that will come when we start to reduce carbon in our atmosphere. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Brittany Hall and Michael, followed by, is it Kent Minault? Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name is Brittany. I'm a youth organizer for Sierra Club in South Central Los Angeles. According to scientists, carbon pollution is making our world warmer. A warmer planet, that means our days will be hotter, which shows the ozone pollution will damage the health of so many communities. In the city of L.A., there's already many health problems, so please support EPA's clean power plan and protect our health and our environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming down. Yes, sir. 
Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Sarmiento with the Sierra Club, and I'm here today to urge the City Council to pass this resolution to support the EPA uh, Clean Power Program. As we all know, uh, carbon pollution really affects all of our health, um, and so I really urge uh, the City Council to pass a resolution to be a leader in the country uh, and be forward thinking and to support clean energy. Thank you. Thank you. Kent? Uh, hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Kent Minow, uh, volunteer coordinator with uh, LA Beyond Coal, the Sierra Club. I'm from Sherman Oaks. Um, I'm speaking in support of the resolution. Uh, there are 491 coal-fired power plants still running in the U.S., down from 660 a decade ago. Their average age is 42 years old, and they produce a third of our domestic greenhouse gas emissions. For every dollar we invest in reducing this catastrophic burden on our atmosphere, Americans will receive $7 in health benefits, and they know it. 70% of Americans want federal limits on greenhouse gases, 63% even if they have to pay 20 bucks a month to get it extra on their bills, which they won't with increasingly implemented efficiency programs which stand to save residents an average of 8% on their utility bills. But the real significance of this move is, uh, is that it's the first genuine federal action on climate that we've seen. Success in setting these very modest limits will change the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, on this item, item 8, Mr. Uh, Weezar, are you good with that? Okay. So on item 8, ladies and gentlemen, we will adopt the CLA report and resolution. So without objection, that will be the order. Thank you all for coming down. Madam uh, Clerk, that should bring us to general public comment. That's correct. Right? So I have a Carol Smith, a Mr. Herman, and Mr. Walsh. Please come. No, we're having a disruption here. So, sergeants, go talk to him. Yes? Yes, uh, Carol Smith, civil rights attorney, withdrawing my request for, for speaking. I had thought there would be another group here. And I needed to address them. We'll be back when it is appropriate to be back. And thanks very much for giving me this few seconds to explain withdrawal of my Thank statement. you. Thank you so much. And you me. are very welcome to come back. So I, uh, if I could have Mr. Herman, Mr. Walsh, uh, there's a card coming. General I'll public comment. Yes. General public comment. I'm, I'm offended that still Mr. Duarte, the officer, sergeant of arms, no, this, this, the general, hold this time, general public comment, general public comment, Mr. Herman, in this committee deals with the things that this committee oversees. The, uh, the officer is not in question. Give him back his time. So give your general public comment. Can we start him with one minute? Thank you. Fellow Americans. Our goal in this world today is to stop global warming. Without it, the future of our children, our young African-American youth, will suffer dreadfully. And it's a crisis today that we, shamefully as Americans, don't put America first for what the issue on global warming. The future of our children is in the hands of this council and this commission. We, the people, demand action. Take this course of action to defend the public, public interests, for we the people continue to promote the action to cease global warming and look to the future of our generation of scientists, our innovators of African Americans who will bring back Los Angeles to its superior days and not like the days when Bradley, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think Mr. Walsh is next, followed John by Hollywood Mr. Highlands. Dude. I mean, Mr. Collin. Yes, sir. John Walsh blogging in HollywoodHighlands.org. Uh, there are some very young children here. Let's just put it this way. Mommy and Daddy tell you not to use bad words. And if you use bad words, I never got my mouth washed out with soap, but my brother did. Okay? I know. Mr. Walsh. What has happened? This is concerns your rules here. Now, don't say this counts. The mayor of the city of Los Angeles used... This has nothing to do with this committee. It has to... Hold this time. It just has to deal with this committee. 
And the rules of decorum does deal with it. Okay, turn his time back on. I'm telling you, why don't you just let me speak? No, why don't you stay on subject? Okay. You're not the running this meeting. Is, I am. I have an FCC complaint filed about the dirty language of the mayor of the city and your support. That has nothing to do with the jurisdiction of this committee. So anyway, Sergeant, he's starting early, disturbing the meeting. Maybe he can take his medication and be calm for the remainder of the day. Mr. Uh, Akala. Excuse me. You just made a very... Uh, degrading, degradable comment. You're calling him crazy. You're telling him to take his medication. Stay on the subject, Mr. Uh, Akala. No, with this committee. Just stay on the subject. You're disrespectful to the people. Stay on the, the, the things that fall within the jur jurisdiction of this committee. Okay, this is called the committee for what? If you're speaking before it, you, you should have some idea. I have an idea. The idea is that you guys are not very bright. No, you are not speaking on a subject here, last warning. All right, uh, that concludes general public comment. What is before this uh, committee, Madam Clerk? That completes all items. It is adjourned. Thank you.